Hello, Tanse, Anini. On behalf of YWCA Edmonton and the Board of Directors, I want to warmly welcome you to our Power Lunch speaker series featuring Tanya Talega. My name is Catherine O'Neill and I am the CEO for YWCA Edmonton, located in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Before I begin, I want to respectfully acknowledge that YWCA Edmonton is located on the Ter Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Saltoy, Anish Anishinaabe, sorry, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures have enriched our vibrant community. YWCA Edmonton has been proudly serving and empowering women and families in our community for 113 years. Through world wars, the Great Depression, the Spanish influenza, we have always been there with a helping hand. So COVID-19 is no different. We are hard at work helping vulnerable women and families in our community get through this crisis and ensure that no one is left behind and, important women, and women's important perspective is at every decision making table along the way. So the Power Lunch is part of our COVID-19 response. While we may not be able to gather in person, it's now important more than ever to gather and host powerful conversations that spotlight amazing Canadian women we think you should know. Our virtual Power Lunch speaker series runs until July 14th and features five incredible Canadian women, including authors, diplomats, and women's rights activists. And today we welcome Tanya Talega to the Power Lunch. Tanya is an award-winning author and journalist and her work in the areas of indigenous rights and reconciliation is groundbreaking. On a personal note, I have known Tanya for 20 years this summer. I first met her when I was an intern working at the Toronto Star and even then she left a very big impression on me. She was fearless, curious and always used the power of the pen for good. I'm thrilled that Tanya will be making a, a presentation today entitled All Our Relations, The Path Forward. It will be followed by a Q&A session that we hope you participate in. We are also joined today by two moderators, YWCA Edmonton Board of Directors, Clarice Anderson and Kim Pays. We are, Clarice holds a master's degree in land-based education and has worked in the field of education for close to 20 years in various capacities. A proud member of the Saddle Lake Cree Nation, she's committed to building capacity in Indigenous education. She also chairs our board's Reconciliation Committee. Kim is an HR professional with 15 years of HR experience and currently works with Hubble Utility Solutions. She holds a Bachelor's of Commerce degree, and she also serves as our board's Vice President. So with that, please grab your lunch and prepare to be inspired. Clarice and Kim, over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Catherine, for that great introduction. And I have the honor of being able to introduce a little bit more detail, Tanya. So Tanya Talega is Ojibwe with roots in Fort Williams First Nations in Ontario. Starting in September, Tanya will be joining the Globe and Mail as a columnist and investigative reporter. She previously worked, as Catherine said, as a journalist for the Toronto Star for more than 20 years and has been nominated five times for the Merchner Award in Public Service Journalism. Tanya holds an honorary Doctor of Letters from Lakehead University in Thunder Bay, in Thunder Bay and shares her experience on the boards of Penn Canada and the Narwhal. Tanya is president and CEO of Makwa Creative, a production company focused on Indigenous storytelling. Tanya is the acclaimed author of Seven Fallen Feathers, which was the winner of the RBC Taylor Prize, the Shaganasi Cohen Prize for Political Writing, and the First Nation Community Read for Young Adults and Adults. The book was also a finalist for the Hillary Weston Writers Trust Nonfiction Prize, 
and the BC National Award for Nonfiction. It was CBC's Nonfiction Book of the Year, a Globe and Mail Top 100 book, and a national bestseller. So congratulations, Tanya, to your achievements there. Tanya lives in Toronto with her two teenage children, but her heart is in Northern Ontario. Her great-grandmother, Liz Gortier, was a residential school survivor. Her great-grandfather, Russell Bowen, was Ojibwe trapper and laborer. Her grandmother is a member of Fort William First Nation, and her mother was raised in Wraith and Graham, Ontario. Tanya has generously waived her speaker fee for today's Power Lunch, but has kindly requested that the YWCA Edmonton instead donate to the Edmonton Canadian Native Friendship Centre. We are also asking attendees to today's Power Lunch to also consider donating to the CNFC. The link has just been posted in the chat box if you, can, if you want to check that out. And you can also find more information about Tani in the chat as well. As Catherine said, Tani's presentation will be approximately 30 minutes followed by a Q&A period that we highly encourage you to participate in. Clarice will be monitoring the, the Q&A and you can post your questions in the Q&A box below. You can also upvote questions to help prioritize them. And with that, over to you, Tanya. Guzu, Anin, Tanya Talaga, Nagis Nikas. I'm so grateful to be speaking to you from the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. I live here in Takaranto, um, and I am, well, in the before times, I was a rather frequent visitor this year to Edmonton and to Calgary and to um, parts of Alberta. Um, and I'm very grateful to be here today. You know, um, it's true, I've known Catherine for a long time. I can't believe it's been 20 years. How does that happen? I don't know. They seem to slip by those years, um, but uh, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to connect with you again, Catherine, and to see all of the great things that you continue to do. You know, you are always an incredible reporter, full of life, and you just went after a story you always came home with it and you played a big and it's so great to see what you're doing now. I'm just, I'm just in awe of you. Um, and I'm really grateful too, to have this ability to speak to all of you, you know, and listening to what the YWCA has done in the past in the Edmonton region. Um, it's really quite remarkable, isn't it? Power of women. I speak a lot about women. Um, I write a lot about women and our powers within community and how it's so important for us as Indigenous women um, to lead the way forward. And it's so wonderful to see that this is going on at the YWCA. And I'm so grateful that Clarice is also on your board as well. I'm going to talk today, um, I'm going to talk about a number of things. I'm going to speak a little bit about what's been happening in the news, what's been going on well across Turtle Island. Um, Turtle Island is what we call North America. And I'm going to tell you a few stories today. I'm going to tell you some stories about myself and I'm going to uh, tell you stories as well about others, about some of the reporting I've done, some of the books that I've written. And I want you to know too that I sometimes speak in circles um, and just stay with me. I always warn people that, you know, what are you, people are wondering, where is she going with that? What's happening? Um, but I do really seem to speak in circles and stick with me because I always have a point. I promise you that. So the first story I'm going to tell is about um, something that happened to me recently. And I actually, I wrote about this recently in an essay to the Globe and Mail. Um, it was in late last September and I was coming in from Toronto on a Porter flight, a late night Porter flight, the last one to get into Thunder Bay. And I was about to check into my hotel in, in Thunder Bay. And before I, I went in, I was standing outside, actually, and um, I, I saw this man coming towards me. And um, he looked like he kind of wanted to say something to me, but he wasn't sure. And, you know, it was one of those situations where it was like midnight. And I was like, oh, do I really want to stand here and talk to someone or should I just go into my hotel? Um, but he had a very kind face. And then he came up to me and um, he said to me, he looked at me and he said, are you, are you the journalist? 
Are you the one that tells the stories that I see on YouTube? And I told him that, yes, that that was me. And he said, you're the one that writes the stories about, about the students who were found, who found floating in the river. And I said, that's me. So we began to talk and his name was um, Troy, Troy Neekin. And I asked him, so Troy, where are you from? Um, and that's something that we often say to each other. If you're a First Nations person, you'll say to another First Nations person, you know, where are you from? And you automatically recognize someone or you know someone who knows someone who is where that person is from. And that was very true to form. When I asked him, where are you from? He said, I'm from Mishkigongamang. And Mishkigongamang First Nation is about a six hour drive outside of Thunder Bay. Um, I have been to the community before a number of times and it is quite close to where my mother is, well, where my mother's from and where she was raised. My mother was raised on the traditional territory of Fort William First Nation um, in a little place is called Race and Graham. And I said to Troy, I said, well, why are you here? You know, what brings you to Thunder Bay? And he said to me, I'm here to pick up um, my son the body of my son. And I apologized. I said, I'm sorry um, to hear this. And um, can you tell me what happened? And he said, well, I don't really know what happened. Um, but what I do know is what I was told um, by police. And I was told that my, my son, he'd requested help from paramedics. He was in mental health distress. And so he was picked up by paramedics and he was taken to the Thunder Bay Regional Health Sciences Center, the hospital there. And he was taken in and to the hospital. And at this point, it's sort of uh, the facts become murky for Mr. Neekin. He didn't really know um, what happened afterwards, but all he knew was six hours later, his son was found hanging across the street at Lakehead University's campus. Lakehead is right across the street from the hospital. So he said to me, you know, he was in shock when I met him. Um, this all had just happened. And he had to take his son back home with him. And he didn't understand why his son who had gone to the hospital to seek mental health care did not get any. He was told by police that what happened to his son was he was taken, the son was taken outside of the emergency ward um, and walked out, escorted out of the hospital. So he received no medical care at all. And that's when he took his life. And you know, I've been thinking about, I've been thinking about Troy and I've been thinking about his son, Craig for quite, um, quite a few months. You know, when it first happened, um, when I first heard what had happened to Craig, I tried to help Troy. I, um, I contacted Anishinaabeaski Nation, which is a political territorial organization um, in uh, just, uh, there's an office in Thunder Bay, but it's for Treaty 9 territory. Treaty 9 territory is um, basically all of Northern Ontario um, north of the Robinson Superior Line in Thunder Bay, the Treaty Line, east over to the James Bay Coast, north to Hudson Bay, and then west over to the Manitoba border. So it's an actually massive, massive amount of land. And I knew that officials at Anishinaabe Aski Nation, in particular the Grand Chief, Alvin Fiddler, were going to be able to help Mr. Neekin and get some questions answered. And I thought about him for a long time a lot of the work I've done centers on racism and it centers on inequality. It centers on education inequality. It centers on healthcare inequality. And I always thought to myself, I'm gonna write, I'm gonna write about Craig, but I'm gonna give it a little while. 
Um, and then everything started happening with COVID. And I started to see the health inequalities all over the place again. I started to see that many of our First Nations communities are without doctors, proper healthcare stations, or without properly trained nurses or facilities. Um, and I saw many of our communities scrambling, you know, many of our communities shut right down in order to avoid anyone coming in that could spread COVID-19. And I saw also too many of our communities making up peer advisory groups of medical professionals uh, because we don't have many in many of our communities in order to advise us on what to do and how to move forward. You know, it's been a really quite an incredible time and I'm um, happy to say that in Northern Ontario and NAN Territory, the peer council work has been really quite incredible. We've had very few cases of COVID-19 and that's really incredible when you think of the fact that many of the communities in the north do not have running water. Try and fight a public health epidemic like COVID-19 without running water. It's pretty tough or without any doctors. It's almost impossible. And you know, as we've seen too, COVID roll into what's been going on south of the border and north of the border with, in the wake of the death of George Floyd, as we've seen demonstrations in city after city after city after George was killed at the hands of police officers in Minneapolis. And as we've heard cries for the police to be defunded and for change to come in many of our institutions for that colonial grip of power and privilege that has proliferated the media that's proliferated governments, sports franchises, and capitalism. As all of these things have been happening around us, I've been thinking about Craig Neekin. I've been thinking that this is our reality as Indigenous people living in constant states of trauma. Our people die daily due to indifference in a country that is preferred to look away rather than to deal with the racism that has existed here for over 150 years. You know, in the last several months, at least eight First Nations Indigenous people have died in altercations with police. In particular, I'm thinking of Aisha Moore, a 16-year-old girl who was shot by Winnipeg police after the stolen car she was in came to a crashing halt. I'm also thinking of a 29-year-old girl, Regis Korczynski Paquette, who passed after she fell to her death from the 24th story of a condo building. And I'm also especially thinking of Chantal Moore. Chantal Moore was a 26-year-old single mom, and she was shot five times by police who were doing a wellness check on her. She was a petite young woman and she was shot five times. And you know, what was really quite remarkable too about Moore's death was it occurred on the exact same time that we were marking in this country, the first year anniversary of the National Inquiry into Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls into that report being released. And one of the hallmarks of the calls for justice in that report was a promised national action plan that would look at how we can keep all vulnerable women safe. You know, that's an incredible thing too, right? I mean, one of the things we've heard about during COVID and that we absolutely know as women is that vulnerable women, women who are in abusive relationships, women who live in housing where they are threatened or they do not feel safe need help during this time. Yet, sadly, our government decided to put off putting out a national action plan as they were supposed to after the one year anniversary into the inquiry. And they said the reason why was because of COVID-19. But I find that really fascinating again, because you know, when you look at it, our government seems to be able to move mountains and help at the drop of a hat. University students who cannot go to school during COVID or find summer jobs, I should say, during COVID-19. 
And we're also helping businesses. We're also helping um, airline industries. Um, but we're not helping women who are in situations where their very lives are threatened. And I reflect about this too when I think of the fact that I've written two books on racism in Canada. The first book was Seven Fallen Feathers. And that book dealt with the deaths of seven children between 2000 and 2011. Each of those seven children were from those, that Nan territory that I was telling you about, Treaty Number no. 9 territory. And each of those children were in Thunder Bay in order to receive a high school education. Because if you live in a First Nations community in Northern Ontario, in Nan territory, you do not have access to a high school. So you have to make a choice. If you want to further your education and achieve that high school diploma, which is a fundamental right of every other child in this country, you have to leave your family, your first language, your home, your community, everything that you know, get on a plane and travel 600 kilometers to live in a boarding home with people you don't know and you have to navigate yourself around a city at the age of 13, 14, 15. And again, in English, usually if you're coming from one of the Nan communities, your first language is Cree or Uji Cree or Ojibwe. And I also think about how right now, after the deaths of those seven children, I should also tell you that Others had died in Thunder Bay before 2000. And sadly, after 2011, more of our children have died in the waters surrounding Thunder Bay. And one of the, um, after that book was written and after an inquest was, um, was held into the deaths of the seven fallen feathers, those children, um, the Thunder Bay Police Force was investigated by the government of Ontario, an offshoot, uh, an agency of the government of Ontario. They looked into allegations of systemic racism into the Thunder Bay Police Force. And they found um, in their report that they did, but they came out with 44 recommendations in December of 2019, that yes, there is systemic racism um, present in the force. And they ordered the reinvestigation of the deaths of nine indigenous people over the last 30 years in Thunder Bay. And of those nine, four are the cases of the seven fallen feathers. So they've ordered the reinvestigation by an outside police force into the death of Jethro Anderson, Kern Strang, Jordan Wabas, and Kyle Morriso. The second book that I wrote focused on genocide. It focused on genocide in this country and in all other colonized nations. And that book um, was the basis of the CBC Massey lectures as well. And that book really looked at how so many of us share similarities in colonized nations in America, in Canada, in Brazil, in the Sami lands, in northern Norway, in northern Sweden, northern Finland, in Australia. How many of our people have all been violently separated from the land? Each of us as Indigenous people have lived on the land for tens of thousands of years, as we say. We've lived there forever, since time began. And in each of these countries, all of our peoples were removed, were put into residential schools, suffered racist policies such as the Indian Act. In Canada, the Indian Act is a piece of legislation that is still on our books today that was created in 1876. And the Indian Act governs the life of every single status Indian in this country if you're born and if you are deemed an Indian under the government of Canada, your name is placed on an Indian registry. You're given a number in this country. When South Africa was looking at apartheid and how to go about apartheid, government leaders came to Canada to study the Indian Act. Now, this is not a lecture on apartheid and about what's been happening in South Africa but I should tell you that apartheid is no longer in existence in one form, but the Indian Act is still very much in Canada's books. The Indian Act also gave way to things like the Indian residential school system 
and as you know, 139 Indian residential schools. So those are schools funded by the Canadian government and schools that are that were run by the Christian churches were all across Canada from the mid 1800s to 1996. That's when the last school closed. And that gave way to many things, intergenerational trauma. It gave way to when the schools closed, the children's aid societies opened up and then our children were removed from homes and taken and placed into other homes, usually non-Indigenous homes to be raised and raised to not be who they are in their culture, in themselves. I have toured Canada. I have spoken in libraries. I've spoken in concert halls. I've spoken in living rooms about the need for equity for our children, regardless of the color of their skin. But I have said, and I continue to say that all of our children deserve the same access to fairness. They deserve an access to a high school education, to doctors. They deserve access to clean water. And they deserve to be growing up in a family where someone loves them, and knows them and tucks them in at night and tells them that they belong. I follow a very long line of Indigenous authors and poets and artists and musicians and writers who have done the same thing as I am doing, writing about injustice with our stories, our voices and our words. And we have been doing this for a very, very long time. And so this is one of the questions that I ask myself. Why has all of Canada not stood up and heard us? You know, I wrote this in the Global Mail. I said that Canada's unique brand of racism can be quiet and it can be loud. It manifests as indifference. And it has crept into all of our public institutions, into our governments, into our corporations, our media. And you can see it in the faces of people as they walk around or by that homeless First Nations man that they see sitting on the sidewalk. Both Black and Indigenous people know what it's like to feel under the knee of a system that has not wanted them to exist, who wants them to be out of the way. And we have known this for a very, very long time. You know, I cannot profess what it is like to be part of a black family, having to face the news of another killing and seeing that happen openly on the streets captured on video. But I do know what it's like to have parents of First Nations families come up to me and ask me, when are you going to write about my son or my daughter? I've heard that too many times. So as everything has been going on, as we've been seeing the demonstrations across Turtle Island, I kept on reflecting on something. I kept on thinking about um, one of the, um, the other Massey lectures, uh, one of the mo more noted Massey lectures to, um, to have been named, and that was Dr. Martin Luther King. And in 1967, he gave a speech that has been sitting with me. And this was uh, 1967, this was um, right before, it was a year before he was assassinated. And he gave a speech at Stanford University on the other America. He said there are two Americas. One America was beautiful and it was overflowing with innocence, the milk of prosperity and the honey of opportunity. It was a home for many, the home of freedom, of human dignity and spirit. In this America, he said, millions of young people grow up in the sunlight of opportunity. But then he spoke of the tragedy of another America, one with ugliness about it, that constantly transform the ebulliency of hope into the fatigue of despair. In that America, millions find themselves living in slums, people perishing in poverty, while an ocean of wealth surrounds them. But he said, you know, what is the most tragic of this other America is what it does to our children who are forced to, quote, grow up with clouds of inferiority forming every day in their little mental skies. We see it as an arena of blasted hopes and shattered dreams. And I've been thinking about that speech a lot 
because I see those same dark clouds in some of our youth. I see it in some of our people when they realize they do not have the same opportunities as others. Opportunities that so many take for granted, like a high school education or clean water or access to their parents, access to a home that's warm and secure. I have seen these clouds form in the eyes of youth as well, who tell me that they are followed by security guards in the mall just because of the color of their skin or because they can't seem to get a job, a summer job, or when they tell me that they are afraid of being stopped by the police. You know, what Dr. King's speech said to me is that you can pass all the legislation that you want in the world. In 1967, he was speaking three years after 1964, three years after the US civil rights legislation was finally, finally put into place. And in this country, in Canada, I think of the laws that we have here. I think of a commitment by the Prime Minister to fulfill all of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action. Or I think of BC being the first province to enact the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People legislation specifically to turn all of BC's laws to follow UNDRIP the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People is signed by 140 nations and the last ones to sign is the United States of America, Australia, and Canada. Three countries that have Indigenous populations that were moved to make way for the settlers. That violence I was talking about earlier, that violent separation of our people from the land. And so I think, you know, that we can pass, as he said, as Dr. King said, you can pass all the legislation that you want in the world, but it really doesn't matter at all unless the will of the majority stand up behind the legislation and make sure that it passes. We all must commit to equity to make sure all of our children are given that same fresh start in a land of milk and honey. There has always been two Canadas from my point of view. One for non-Indigenous people, those given free land to farm on. One Canada, where there's a strong public education system, incredible colleges and universities that offer opportunity to for so many. And one that has a universal healthcare system that's supposed to take care of every single one of its citizens. Then there is a Canada for Indigenous people. One where, as I said earlier, our people were violently taken off the land, in many cases by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and our children were stuck into Indian residential schools until 1996. If our children are lucky, they have a high school to attend. If our children are lucky, they also have access to a doctor to a pharmacy and a health clinic in their community. If our children are lucky, they have access to clean drinking water that they can bathe in or wash their vegetables in, wash their clothes in, water that they can drink. Our children seem to languish in between these two Canadas. And here is where we need to pay attention and we need to make space. Our children listen to politicians who promise that they care and who pass legislation to try and make things right. But it want, when it comes to practice, the words are empty. And of course, again, I think of Craig Meekin. I think of him coming from a community where if he wants to go to high school, he has to leave and come into Thunder Bay. And Craig Neakin had dreams. He had just turned 21 and he was in high school to try and get a high school education. And he was really close to his dad. They used to text every other day. And his dad said, you know, he was quite a kid. He knew everything about treaties and he knew everything about historical facts. Um, and he also said that his son had been hospitalized before for suicidal ideation. 
yet on the night of Craig's death, he had only been seen for 10 minutes inside the emergency department at the Thunder Bay Hospital. 10 minutes. That's all he was afforded before he was escorted out of the hospital by security guards. In the wake of Craig's death, the hospital has had a quality review committee. They've had a meeting with Troy and they've said that they regret what happened and they've come up with a list of practices and policies that they would like to bring forward to change to make sure that this never ever happens again. But I have to tell you that Mr. Neekin is not satisfied. He's still waiting to hear an apology and a real answer as to why it is his son was not cared for. So I'm gonna end with something that Grand Chief Alvin Fiddler from Anishinaabe Aska Nation said to me. We were talking about the demonstrations and there was a de demonstration, um, a Black Lives Matter demonstration in Thunder Bay. And Alvin told me it was amazing to see. He said, so many people came out, you know, so many non-Indigenous people came out, many Indigenous people were there, and they all rallied for Black Lives Matter. And Grand Chief Fiddler told me, you know, I hope this isn't just a fad. I want them to acknowledge what is happening also in this country, that this is not just an American problem. He said to me, I hope they open their eyes and see what is happening here in this country. And then he said, that's my message to all of the allies that have come out. If we are going to create systemic change, if we're gonna look at the fact that so many of our people make up the population inside jails all across the West and in Northern Ontario, in family services, and if we're gonna change any of the inequities we see, if we're gonna bring clean water to our people, we need for everyone to stand up with us. The will of the majority must stand with us to make sure this no longer happens. And getting back to Dr. King, those that do nothing, those who are indifferent, those who say, give it time, things will get better in time. Those people work against us because time does not solve all wounds. Waiting on time has always been a tool of those who are indifferent, and that allows systemic racism to flourish in our governments, our agencies, our corporations, and our institutions. As Dr. King said, good people who choose to remain indifferent and wait on time are just as damaging and deadly as those who carry bats and guns and walk the streets and kill our people. The progress of our nations has never ever, they've never moved forward because we sat back and we waited on time. The time is now. The time is now for all of us to gather our allies and stand together and to make this country what it can be, what it professes to be. And that would be a good thing for all of our children, no matter what color they are or where they live. And with that, I would like to say Kichi Miigwech, and I will take any questions that you have. Hi, hi, Tanya. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I also talk in circles, so I have a question that will come around full, full circle. Um, I have a young son and he fractured his arm while playing on a trampoline a few weeks ago. And the conversation I had with my husband before taking him to the hospital was, I don't want to go because my hair was up in a ponytail. I thought I have to get dressed. I have to do my hair. I have to look presentable. My husband is Métis Cree. His skin's a little lighter than mine. So you need to take him because if you, if I take him, there's a possibility child services will be called. So this is a reality 
um, that many individuals face. When I think of my mom's community, which is two and a half hours northeast, they just had running water that they can drink last year, 2019. So part of our conversations that we have daily within our social circles and within um, friends and family is these issues um, affecting social issues within First Nations, Métis, Inuit families across Canada. And this is tough work and it's exhausting and it's, it's tiring and it weighs on your soul. So how do you ground yourself? Because I imagine you have many individuals contacting you for support and for help. Mm. Um, get you miigwech for, for that question and for sharing your story, you know, um, that's totally, totally understandable, right? You know, it's, and it's very personal and, uh, but it's a reality, you know, um, look what just was happening in BC too. Um, with the emergency room and the, uh, the healthcare professionals were taking bets on who was quote unquote drunk coming in to the ER. Um, the racism in the healthcare sector is just remarkable and it feeds into child services being called and this and that. I mean, our children are taken away from mothers right out, right out of the delivery room. Um, it's, it's, it's something that we all talk about and each one of our families has been affected by. Um, how do I, it's hard, isn't it? It's hard to turn everything off. You know, you can't um, because this is, this is our lives. This is what we deal with all the time. For me, what I do is I speak to um, my elders. I call him my elder because I've been working with him and I, I just uh, adore him for forever. Um, Sam Ashney Paneskum. He's helped me a lot. Um, we speak almost every day. Um, and it could be anything from like, of course, on Facebook Messenger, like he'll send me a little gif of a cat on a typewriter or like, you know, he'll just be funny because he's funny. Um, we'll just talk and we'll keep in contact. I keep in contact with so many people, like keeping in contact with Troy Neekin, with the families of the Seven Fallen Feathers, um, with members of my community, um, you know, who I can't see right now because they're in Thunder Bay and I'm in Toronto. Um, and it's hard, well, travel is restricted. Um, it's hard. Ceremony, though, helps me too. The lodge helps a lot. Thank you. So I have a question here from Megan Klein. It said, what recommendations do you have for opening conversations with people who do not see racism against Indigenous peoples as their problem to solve because they are not racist? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, oh, I don't know what I should say to that one, um, other than um, hmm, everybody's got the drunken Uncle Charlie that sits in, like, you know, when you have a family dinner, there's always a guy in the corner that has a racist joke, has a joke about the drunken Indians, or, oh my God, we're giving them some more money, really? All they do is take money on those reserves, and what are they doing with them? Oh my God. You know, that's, it's always remarkable to me. Everyone, when they, like, everyone has their own preconceptions about everyone else. And especially in this country about Indigenous people. And for so long, Canadians have looked away. You know, Cindy Blackstock used that phrase with me uh, once before, and it's so true. You know, we have a culture of looking away. Oh, that's not my problem as a non-Indigenous person. That's an Indian problem. That's a problem for the federal government, the chiefs, and the reserves, right? Um, but I would argue that if we want to build a stronger Canada, everyone here deserves the same opportunity. And if you look at the fact that we are all treaty people, except for parts of BC, you know, but we are all covered by treaty in this country. Everyone who lives here, 
So we're all in this together. And as my friend Max Finday often says, we're not sending anybody back on boats. You know, they came here by boats and we're not saying, hey, you got to leave. We're here. We have to work this out. So open that conversation. It's not going to be easy. And um, point people in the direction of books. Doesn't have to be my book. It could be Thomas King's The Inconvenient Indian. Um, it could be Chelsea Vowell's book. Oh, what's it called? What's it called? Don't see it here on my bookshelf. But uh, Chelsea Vowell has an incredible book that is a primer on um, First Nation, Métis, Inuit people. Indigenous rights. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So next question is, and that was Chelsea Vowell. So V-O-W-E. Yeah, 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 let me see. Yeah. Another question here is, you said today, we have known this for a very long time. This is powerful. These are facts and injustices that happen to our people, and yet so many are just learning about it now. I'm an educator. The curriculum and teaching standards just came into effect in Alberta 2017. While I have a tremendous amount of hope how is our education system going to tell the stories and change the future? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. Um, you know, Senator Murray Sinclair has said to me before, education very much got us into this mess and education will get us out of this mess. Um, as you know, Senator Sinclair was the chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, and he heard the stories of over 6,600 survivors and witnesses to the IRS. And um, I think that our hope very much is with educators and with teachers. Um, and actually, before COVID, I was in Alberta, I think I mentioned quite a bit, I'm February, who knew? February is Teacher Conference Month in Alberta. Um, and so I was there almost every week, um, speaking to various uh, boards and associations. And that is the future, you know, and it's always remarkable to me too, that many of our teachers are women, right? And we are still leading the way forward. You know, we're the ones, the women are, and the teachers are the ones that are gonna have to get out there and familiarize themselves if they're non-Indigenous on the Inconvenient Indian, Seven Fallen Feathers, changing up that curriculum, you know? And if there were changes in 2017, but I understand that there's still many changes that need to be um, undertaken in Alberta and the boards have to sort of get be behind that and make those changes on their own. Um, and the classrooms do as well. Um, in Ontario, we have um, started something in grade 11. Some of the school boards, not all, but some of the school boards are swapping out their grade 11 um, traditional English classes that focus on Shakespeare and on American authors with all Indigenous authors. You still get Shakespeare and everyone else in grades 9, 10, and 12, but in grade 11, you get authors from this country. That's an incredible thing because we have to change the minds of children. And then once we do that, those are the future lawmakers and the politicians and the police officers. Those are the ones we need to reach. Thank you. We have a, another question here from Carrie Menin. She said, hi, Tanya, thank you for the stories and your wisdom. I work in healthcare and it's stories like Craig that break my heart. And unfortunately, stories I hear far too often. As individuals, we can make change within ourselves, but how do we make impact on institutions like a healthcare organization? That's hard, you know. Um, it was interesting when I started writing um, Seven Fallen Feathers, I didn't realize that the book was going to be so much focused on the failures of the education system in Canada and the provincial education systems in Canada. And when I started writing All Our Relations, I didn't realize I was going to be writing on the healthcare systems failure um, with Indigenous people in this country. And, you know, no matter, like, it's, it's like we go from one, oh my gosh, to the other, because education is just like, oh, but healthcare, if it's possible, is even worse. Um, there, 
the healthcare system was not set up in this country whatsoever to um, look into or look after First Nations people. You know, when all of those people, 150,000 people were sent to their residential schools, and when they left those schools, many of our children were broken. They didn't know where they were from anymore. They couldn't speak their language. They had a whole host of um, abuse issues that they had suffered. And there was no hospital system there to take care of them. There was no mental health system widespread to help survivors at all. People were just released. We had Indian hospitals in this country. I write about them in all our relations. Um, in the 1960s, I believe it was the 1960s, by the 1960s, we had 20 fully functioning Indian hospitals. That's hospitals just to treat First Nation, Métis, Inuit people in this country. Um, so there's, there's a long way to go. The Canada Health Act, you'll be really hard pressed to find the word First Nations in there, Métis. I, I've looked, you won't find it. So we need to change people, you know, and again, how do we do that? It's gonna be generational change, but to start, read and familiarize as much as you can um, and bring people in. Hospitals and healthcare institutions should see where, which land they're on, whose land they're on, and invite elders in for meetings and say, how can we help? What are your complaints? How can we make things better? I always think that's a good idea with education to schools. Definitely. I'm an educator as well. And, and part of our role is to provide professional learning for educators around First Nations, Métis, Inuit histories, um, culture, and all of those pieces. So that definitely is a question that that comes up often is there is a strong need and desire to learn more and it's often the how so we'll move into the next question kathleen says uh, thank you for your work and the truth that you share we have seen reports commissions journalists and artists showing that indigenous people and children are treat indigenous children are treated unfairly we know the federal government systemically underfunds indigenous children as a non-Indigenous person, what can I do, aside from writing to politicians, to confront the systemic racism that Indigenous people, Indigenous people and children face today? Thank you very much for your, for your question. Um, it's something all of us can do, but it's something none of us can do, because this, again, is getting back to the will of the majority and uh, making sure that everyone is educated and that everyone is in support of the changes that are happening. Um, support indigenous candidates in elections, in school boards, trustees. How many indigenous trustees sit on school boards? I'm gonna tell you, well, actually I can't tell you what Edmonton is like, but I can tell you Toronto, the largest school board in this country, we don't have any, none. And so many of our kids do, go to schools in cities. We go to the public school boards and the Catholic school boards. So support candidates, you know, um, to, to go there, to onto those boards. Also too in municipal politics, because all politics is local. Um, and no matter where you are, you know, where you work, um, extend your hand to the local friendship center. Speak to elders or the local um, band council you know, schools can say, hey, will you please come in and have a meeting with us and tell us a little bit about the place that we're sitting on so we can localize our education and what can we do for you to bring you into the school and help out with things. Um, libraries. So many places are community gathering places too. We need to have more getting to know each other, you know. Um, I'm in awe of the Thunder Bay Library and all the things that they're doing to combat racism right now. It's incredible. Libraries are looking at how they can change themselves. Get involved there, suggest things. Um, but it's going to take uh, many of us. 
So I think we have time for one last question before I hand it over to Catherine. Um, and this is from Terry, and she asks, what advice would you give to Indigenous women working in these systems? Mm. Hey, Rich. Um, my goodness, it's tough, isn't it? You know, um, it's often tough because sometimes if you speak up, you're looked at a problem, right? Or, um, you know, somebody on Twitter the other day was uh, saying an activist, um, if you're an Indigenous or a Black or a woman of colour and you are trying to sort of bring a voice forward, you're called an activist. Um, and that's so very true. Gather your allies. Don't be afraid to speak out and speak up. Be proud of yourself and who you are and know that we're proud of you too. And you're not standing alone. You always stand with your ancestors, you know, and you stand with all of us. And um, make sure you practice ceremony and you smudge. <laughs> That's the best way I could say it. <laughs> Uh, thank you for those beautiful words. I feel like you're the oracle from the matrix and I should ask you if I should cut my hair or something. That's <laughs> um, great. Thank you so much. I'm going to hand it over to Catherine now. Miigwech, Clarice. You're muted, Catherine. Sorry about that, guys. Um, Thank you, Tanya Megwich. On behalf of the Edmonton, YWC Edmonton Board of Directors and staff, thank you from the bottom of our heart. You, this was a very important presentation. It was moving, it was powerful, but most of all, it was a call to action for all of us. And I, I've heard it loud and clear, and I hope everyone listening today has heard it loud and clear. We all need to commit to this work. And, um, and I appreciate the efforts that you've done. And thank you to our moderators today, Clarice. Thank you to Kim. We much appreciate your work on behalf of the YWCA Edmonton. You do great work. So thank you, lastly, to our participants, the people attending today's session. Thank you for uh, coming and watching. We hope you stay in touch. The YWCA Edmonton needs your help, so please Stay involved, um, donate, volunteer, just get involved and help us with our mission. We also are very committed to building a stronger, safer, more equitable world for everyone. And it means everyone. So help us do this work. We need your support now more than ever. And just for some housekeeping, our next and very last Power Speaker Lunch Series is Tuesday, July 14th. It will be featuring Casey Matchin. She is the co-founder and chair of Parity Yay, and she will be talking about the road to the next municipal election in 2021 and how we can reach gender parity. It's going to be an incredible conversation. Uh, you won't want to miss it. So until then, have a great afternoon, and thanks again, Tanya. Miigwech. Nice Miigwech. to see you all. Bye. Bye, Catherine. Bye. Bye, Bye Tanya. Bye.